research. So does that sound great? Oh, sounds perfect, yeah. Great. So, uh, first question is, uh, what kind of work do you do, and how does it relate to, to grief, and, and what type of people do you work with? Uh, right at this point in my life, right? I've, I've had a lot of different jobs in my life, but my a my avocation uh, is working with the bereaved. And uh, stopped doing my occupation two years ago, and just so I could devote all my time to my avocation, which is serving the bereaved. And so the works I've worked with a lot of different groups, um, with the Compassionate Friends. I don't know if you've heard of the Compassionate Friends, but the Compassionate Friends is the largest grief organization in the world. There's uh, over 750 chapters across the country, in Canada and in Europe. Uh, it started with uh, a few people around a kitchen table in England, um, and, and they said they needed you need a compassionate friend. So they started the uh, compassionate friends, and it, the need was so there that when it crossed the pond, it just went crazy in, in the United States. People just started to think, oh, there's nothing for us for bereaved parents because no one understood that. The bereaved parent loss was so life-changing. Uh, rest of your life, it's not. Uh, you don't get married again, and not minimizing a, a spousal loss, but um, it's just different. Uh, and so, and when you, it's it's like part of you. And then, even a, for a mother, for a woman uh, who had gave birth, uh, you know, like the, when they have postpartum blues after they give birth. Uh, they they grieve the loss of that baby within them. So when they lose their child again, I mean it's it's very very real on a physical level. They're physically missing that child. So uh, and it kind of disrupts the natural order too, where you know the parents are supposed to die before the yeah, child. It's, yeah, yeah, it's out of order. It's an out of sequence death, and that takes you by surprise. One thing, and because you're not prepared, your your whole future depended on your child. You have so the, the loss of a child is. Years and years and years of of grieving triggers that just grieve all over again. You know, the, I call it collateral blessings and collateral grief in, in grief. So, the collateral grief we have is the birthdays and holidays and Christmases. And you know, my son died at nine years old, but I remember that that year that he would have graduated, and I heard pomp and circumstance. It just pissed me off. You know, because he wouldn't, he couldn't graduate. He was nine years old when he died, and here I am, all these years later. You know, thinking that you know his 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 buddies are. You know, but one of his buddies from uh, graduated did call me. He said, "I stole the pinata from Kelly's last birthday party." He, yeah, he can't get rid of it. So, so there's, there's kind of neat things. And so, I early on, uh, um, I, I I joined that compassionate friends. I, I just I saw I, I didn't know about it. You know, it was, they were called TCF and. I, you know, I thought there was a bank in Minneapolis, you know, and I never <laughs> yeah. heard of TCF before. And so I, I didn't find it till later, and so my son died in 87. So when I book came out, uh, the book that you read was in 2002, and I, that's, I've been working on it for years, you know, and I worked at a refinery for years, and I could never finish it. Then I got a job at this little Catholic school as a boiler operator, and went from an executive job in 12 or 14 hours a day to just playing with these little boilers eight hours a day. And I, I could go home, I finished my book, I started speaking, I started writing, I started going, you know, and really living my life, my passion, because I could do it there, because I wasn't in this big management job. And so that kind of just, I was just speaking and talking about my book. Okay, okay. And that brought me to, to today, is that now that I, my, with my book out there and those speaking engagements turned into more speaking engagements so I don't even sell my book as much as I get called upon to come to different areas uh, to speak. What, what other group? The Compassionate Friends is one big one I've been with for since 2004. Every year they have a national conference and I go to that. Okay. And, and, they, and, so, and I speak. There's some 1,500 people there. And uh, this year um, uh, it'll be in Orlando. And so there's going to have a lot of um, um, people and parents from parents of the lost children in the pulse. You know, no matter how old your children are, they don't have to be little ones. That, that you, a 90-year-old woman loses her 70-year-old son. It hurts just as much as a mom losing, you know. It, so there'll be a lot of people in Orlando that are still suffering. And so it, we're, I'm glad we'll be available for them. So I like working with the Compassionate Friends because I reach out to those bereaved parents. And, uh, but I'd also work with military loss or TAPS, the TAPS, the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors of Military Loss, started by Bonnie Carroll way back in the eight, uh, 80s. Um, she was the original, uh, I don't know if you ever heard the old phrase, um, 
uh, Save the Whales. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a joke. It's you know, like for a do-gooder or a tree hugger, you go, oh, you're going to go save the whales? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she is the one who saved the whales. <laughs> I mean, she lived in Barrow, Alaska, and she orchestrated that whole thing with, uh, with Russia. I mean, she worked for Reagan back in the time, and she organized this whole thing. And the, one of the helicopter pilots, pilots that were helping uh, guide these whales out of the ice in, in Barrow, Alaska, she fell in love with and got married, and, and then he was killed. And, and so she said there was nothing for a military mo uh, wife, no, no groups. And so she started this group for uh, people that um, had lost, military loss. And now that, there's like, there's like a 1,200, 1,500 people who come to Washington, D.C. every year. I think that this had their 20th anniversary of, of the TAPS organization. So that organization reaches out just to military loss, really defines it. Kind of a, when you're on the same page, it, it helps. Because the military loss is so different it's different than the same. Everything is so, there's a sense of pride, you know, and there was, it was their loved one made the choice. They, they put themselves in harm's way. They, they, jo they, whether a firefighter or military or a police officer or EMT, yeah. people that put themselves in harm's way have a choice. And so when their family are bereaved, they, it helps a little. It helps a little bit, you know, because they know that was their choice, and they're proud that they served our country and they died for our country. But that that doesn't take the sting of pain away. But it helps when they all come together that they all speak in the same language and they have the same compliance about the, what the military does or doesn't do. Because this is not a military organization. It serves the military families, but it did not want to be hamstrung by milita military or government constraints. It wanted to be just a grassroots mom organization and that's what it still is with deep pockets of insurance companies and so they don't want anybody telling them what to do and they're they're oh they're doing wonderful things they're oh they take people on Mount Kilimanjaro I mean they take wow. you know they all go over the world they go whitewater rafting in Montana and they and they have conferences in all the different cities and 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 meet and it's just a wonderful organization so I'm proud to work for TAPS and I've work, been working for them about eight years now and go to Washington DC every year. Oh, okay. And uh, that's uh, really proud because I was in the 70s, I, I, I had my number for the draft for Vietnam and I was scared to death. I didn't want to go. Well, you know, I was a peace neck. I said, peace, love, dove. You know, I, I didn't want to go. Um, but now I get to serve those who served. And it, it's now I get to do my chance. So even though I, I did not serve then, I'm serving now in a big way. I think so too. Yeah, and that, that, that makes me feel good, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so TAPS and, and Compassionate Friends, do you, uh, do you mostly do speaking engagements? Yes, do you, I do. You I do, do personal counseling or anything like that? Uh, sometimes, uh, not through the organizations, you know. Uh, through those organizations, I, I, I do workshops. Uh, I do a keynote presentation. I'll do radio interviews. I'll write articles for their websites or their magazines and just participate uh, you know, that way. And then with the Compassionate Friends, there's groups, 700 some groups across the country. So sometimes a city will have four or five, like in you know, some of the bigger cities, there may be eight chapters. You know, like Atlanta is huge. So I've gone to Atlanta almost every year and, and do a kind of Atlanta tour. And I go to Texas and do kind of a Texas tour. There's a lot of it around Dallas and Houston, a lot of TCF, Compassionate Friends groups. And so I, I go to their conferences or I, I just, they, they fly me out there and, and I do a workshop you know, uh, that they set up at a church or a building. Uh, but I've had uh, individuals, too, contact me and just kind of do a grief intervention. Can you come out? A man flows out to his, in Florida, I mean, uh, in California, in Oceanside, and uh, his, his wife, his wife asked him one day and said, uh, no, they have a hugely successful real estate business and in, in a beach business in Oceanside, California. You know, this is big bucks in Del Mar and, you know, and so they had very, very good. And then their oldest son was taking over the business. They were looking forward to retire. They were about my age and their son died of cancer. And it just took the wind out of his sails and the dad, he just couldn't, you know, he couldn't do what he did before. The youngest son was kin to it, but not really, you know, going to be ready to take over the reins. and. So uh, Richard, my friend, he just said, uh, I just was just sitting, you know, and that can happen sometimes. You just sit and you get apathetic and you know, well, nothing matters anymore. I just don't care. And he was really in that, that's the worst deleterious emotion in grief is apathy. 
You don't care about your hygiene. You don't care about your health. You don't care about your friends. You don't care about your job. You don't care about a thing. And it's not so much depression. You know, there's some there's some some differences, you know. But uh, apathy is you just you just don't care, you know. Say let let the world have its way with me. And that's where he was. And his wife called. called I met him once at a conference, you know. And then she called me like three, four months, six months later, and said, Mitch. She goes, I, I talked to Richard. I said, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to do for him. I just don't know what to do. And I said, Richard, what can I do? What can I bring you out of your phone? How can I help you? He said, well, you can fly Mitch Carmody out here. <laughs> and so she called me and said, this is sounds good. I said, oh, no, I'll come. I'll, you know, I, I said, I have a weekend off. And truly, I, and I said, and she goes, I'll pay for it. And, and, and she said, my son, John, you know, we had, the, we had this beautiful condo. You can stay at the condo. And his, he, he bought a, because he, he was dying, he bought a brand new black Porsche. And it's sitting in the in the condo, and it's, it's yours for the week if you want it. <laughs> Driving down California Highway One on a Porsche. Wow. <laughs> it was, you know. So it was, and I loved talking with with his dad and Richard, and I did a workshop in their living room with two older kids and a sister, and and I do sign language, and I created a song for each one of them, and I and I and I sang a song that represented their relationship or whatever it was that I felt. You know, I think they, they thought this guy, I'm blooming idiot, who's this guy doing it, singing to me in my living room? But it, it, that's the first time that the family talked about John. First time they all got together and opened up, and they opened up, and it, it was the switch that family needed. Now they're a thriving business. They, they, we have the condo once a week. Anytime we want, we, we're taking my, my kids out there in two weeks. We're going to the condo again. And my, I'm a minister, so my, we're, it's so nice. We're gonna get, my daughter hasn't been married yet. They've been married together for 14 years, raising two kids. They're, you know, we, we just never got around to it. So I said, well, I'm a minister. We've got a beautiful condo in Oceanside, California. And Mark, let's get married. So they're getting married, you know, and, they, and they, the, the couple is so excited. They're going to put on a reception for us. And they're so, and they said, oh, we love your their grandkids. Our grandkids are like their grandkids. So we, we have friends. I could probably stay in almost every major city in this country at a brief parent's house. Uh, because I've, I've connected with them. It, we, it's a whole new relationship because yeah, it's just deeper. I was just going to comment about that. You seem to be forming these really deep connections with people that you've worked with, you know. Just uh, it, yes, it, stories it, because you, you, you go to such a sacred space. You go to the, the I mean, the, you know, when you're in that space, you're low, 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 and you're, you're, you are being totally vulnerable. If you allow yourself vulnerability, because I talk about vulnerability, and tell people, allow the tears, open you up, you know, get out of the fetal position and just bear everything and, and feel it. Be vulnerable to pain, be vulnerable to the joy. Uh, humans, we can carry joy and pain at the same time. So we can do that. It's melancholy. Then we feel both, you know, sorrow and, and, and joy at the same time. And uh, to, to be able to experience that it, it, with other people of the same ilk, that same plot, they go, it's so freeing. Then they start to be more vulnerable because they're, they can let their guards down. You know, I say, I can let my guard, yeah, you can let your guard down. You can, you put it up to go to work. You got to function. You got to pay bills. You put the mask up and function. But take the mask off when you come home. Don't wear it in front of your family. That's where a lot of family problems are. They wear masks for each other. They're all trying to protect each other. Not go there. Not go there. I don't want to go there. You know, and we're fickle in grief. You know, we may not want to go there. We just don't want to talk about it. I used to go to Cottage Grove to shop grocery shopping. Um, not in my town. because I did, And but yet at the same time, I was bitching that no one would ever ask Kelly. How's Kelly doing? How are you doing? Or, Sorry about your side. I see him in the grocery store. They walk the other way. And yet, I go to grocery shopping 20 miles away, so I don't bump into anybody. So I'm fickle. I'm complaining. They're not talking to me. But yet, I'm sending out radar that says, don't come near me. You know, and I was at a grocery store one time, and I was shopping in Cottage Grove. But Cottage Grove is where I went to high school. You know, oh, okay. so. Oh, so you grew up? I didn't know you grew up. Like I grew up, yeah. I actually oh, okay. grew up. I grew up on Great Cloud Island in Mississippi, and my dad was a constable, and, and so I went to Park High School, and so I went to, and grow, I saw that a guy from high school, I hadn't seen him in years, like, oh, I don't want to go there today. I don't, you know, I don't, you have to have energy to, re it's nice people give you compassion, but you can have energy to receive it, because you just don't take it. Either you steal up so you don't cry, you know, uh, and, or, or you just blather all over them, and you don't want to do that in a public place. So it's easier sometimes just to, uh, to practice avoidance. So I, I said, oh, shit. And I jumped on the other side of the aisle. And he evidently saw me and heard about that I lost my son, because we have a tight network and people knew. And, and he jumped over. And, <laughs> and we both saw each other. <laughs> and we just saw our body language, obvious. Oh, come on. We walked up, gave me a hug. How you doing, man? 
time, you know. It broke the ice. And I talked about it. I'm so glad I did. I was ready to bowl. He was ready to bowl. But serendipity brought us together, and it was felt really good. <laughs> you know, so you just don't know when it's going to happen. Sure. You know, sure. They were, where are your supports coming from? And that's why when you meet bereaved families and bereaved parents at these conferences and people that have a like, um, you're at ease. You know you can say things. You have the same. Inf you can talk the same way. That's why there's so many specialized groups because you have the same. For like for suicide loss, there's another special. That's, that's another whole. You know, or the choking game. Young men dying from masturbating. You know, with and hanging themselves. They don't mean to kill themselves, but yet the penumbra of shame around the act is. is they can't. The, the, I, a dad, he said, you know, my household accident. And finally, he talked to me later. He had a cigarette one time. He's out having a cigarette, and and he said, I, I say that in front of the group. But he said he died of the choking game. You ever heard of it? And I go, yeah, it's not um, He said, I can't tell. How, who do I tell? How, who do I open up to about it? You know, it's just people who judge you about it. You cannot see how people react. Oh, you know, they just react. Or if it's suicide, or if it's an over, or if it's an overdose. Oh, <laughs> you just want to choke them because what do you mean? Oh, it's a mental. Overdose, it doesn't, it, everybody's judging you right away. So when you're in a, in a, in a suicide group or in a group that, no one's judging you, you're all on the same page. It seems so helpful because I think, you know, just knowing what I know about suicide, there's this, not only are the parents going through, um, you know, a grieving process, but there's also that shame where they, are they, they feel like almost responsible for it. Are they, they're wondering, like, they what, should what have they, seen it coming. Have they seen it coming, or what could I have done differently, or is this my fault somehow? Right, did because I raised him wrong, or I slapped him when he was 12, or you know, well, you, you go back, even if you, if your child dies and there's you can't find a thing that you did wrong, you're going to manufacture something, you're going to find something, because I'm responsible for their life. Somehow I screwed up and I did not prevent their death. So, you know, I gave him the car keys and then he got killed. Why did I give him the car keys, you know? I, and so you, you'll find something, you know? Yeah, and I think that must, you know, because you're, you're talking about the importance of, you know, being around these different, having these different groups, and I think in, in a case like that, that's like so important, because it's definitely a, a different layer to grieving than somebody that, like, maybe... You know, lost their husband that uh, who died of, of cancer. Oh, yeah, right. Like that. And, 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 not that, and not that one's you know more in, you know worse than the other, but it's it's different. It's different. My son died of cancer, and people who, who die of cancer have children. They get all the they get all the support in the world. People flock all everybody. Oh my God, their child dies of cancer. He's got cancer. All that poor that poor family. They just flock to support you. Mm -hmm. They die of suicide. People run the other way. Mm -hmm. You know that's it. And it's so it's, and people see that. You know, and at tables when you're mixed with a lot of people and you hear someone say, well, at least they didn't die by suicide. There could be someone sitting that has suicide. So what are you judging me that my son died by suicide or my daughter did that, you know, and, and suicide is so, there's so many components of suicide. You know, and I've been studying suicide because I've worked with many parents that were suicide and that if you did an overlay map of the, of the suicide rates in this country, over a topography map of this country, they're almost identical to the highest elevations of the highest suicides, the lowest elevations of the lowest suicides. Really? Yes. The highest rate, I, I, I know, in Montana and Wyoming. The lowest is New Jersey and Manhattan. Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, I, I was this joke I've asked people. They, people saw it the other way. All the tension and blah, blah, blah. No. Manhattan and Jersey are at sea level. That Afghanistan, a lot of suicides are coming back. That's high in the mountains. It's hypoxia. When you have hypoxia, you you reduce oxygen. It, it it really can acerbate depression. And if you're if you're on antidepressants and other drugs that actually consume oxygen, or you smoke, it consumes oxygen. Or if you're tense and in the PTSD and the flight or flight response, and you breathe intercostally here because you're just so tight, you're in the, the fetal response, you're holding your ribs in, you're breathing intercostal muscles. You aren't breathing here. So you're breathing shallow, you're smoking cigarettes, you're hot eye elevation, you're under high stress every day. That all adds up to the perfect storm. And then have one more thing. Then your girlfriend sends you a letter and says, I'm breaking up with you. You know, bam, maybe that, that could be the one straw. Uh, and they try to seek help in the military for the PTSD that they come back and, you know, but there's a catch-22, which is originally a military term, but there's a catch-22 that if they seek support and seek, and they, the military says, oh, we're providing all the support for PTSD, that they, we have all these programs and they, you know, but if you go to the, one of those programs, you're never going to get a, a promotion. That's the trouble. So they don't go seek these programs because they need a soldier that's not going to, you know, 
fault or under pressure. You know, they, they want this. And so they said, no, they, so they, 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 they want to get their raise. They want to get that money, you know. And so they're not, they're not going to go and get help because then... Because it's perceived as a sign of weakness. It's perceived as a sign it's of fragile. weakness. Where yeah. vulnerability is looked at as being a weakness. When they're vulnerable to their own emotions, what they need, and it's looked at as a weakness. And vulnerability, Brene Brown, a vulnerability expert, says, you know, the vulnerability is, it's, it's, it is actually your greatest strength. If you look at the soldier in the, the look at the soldier on the field, the hero that is on that field, running on ahead of all the other soldiers, he is the most vulnerable person on the yeah, field. Yeah. He's putting himself in harm's way for everybody, and that total vulnerability gives him power. It scares people on the other side. So vulnerability actually is our largest strength, which is contrary to popular belief. Yeah, and I think she was saying, too, that that's kind of how we, we connect most strongly with other people, too, even when we're just being, like, emotionally or vulnerable. But, yes. Um, it would just kind of, it seems kind of irony, too. <laughs> but we connect, because I, I think we connect on a different level. We connect at a spiritual level when we're vulnerable, because mm. we're opening our whole, our whole self up. And, and we, we breathe from spirit a little bit more when, we're, when we depend on spirit. And we oh, my God, we, we, we say things that, you know, I've said things that I had no idea where they're coming from sometimes. When you get into that, into that vulnerable space you know uh, with other people too so i go i call it mu sitting um, sitting in a mud puddle with them you just you know i'll oh. sit there i'll sit in a mud puddle as long as you need to because not everybody's people are going to walk by don't even see you in the mud puddle you're just like someone homeless on the street people just keep walking by you're, you're just uh, and you're in grief and it's the same you're getting that same feeling until someone does sit down and says can i take you to lunch you know and, and that's all it takes sometimes it's that one act of kindness just to because <sighs> when you're happy start breathing better too you know so when you when you laughter that's why laughter is so Norman cousin talked about laughter is the best medicine because when you laugh you start to breathe <laughs> you can't help it you know or when you scream you breathe why women scream in labor too I mean you scream and not only the screaming it, it produces the you know the hormones that for pain relief and whatnot and that's why we scream you know when I get older now when I when I drop a pencil or something I, I, I saw like a pirate Arrgh! when I reached down to pick up that pencil because it hurts, it helps my arthritis. You know, oh, well just that act of doing that does send hormones that relieves pain. So everything we do is so body based that we listen to it. Yeah, you know, why when, you, when you're grunting to do something in Minnesota, woof da! You know, well, that, it, it does send chemicals. It's a you know, yeah. it, when we understand that we have everything we need to survive this planet, uh, if we take care of the planet, but we can take care of ourselves first because we are our best stewards. You know, if we take care of ourselves, then we can be stewards of the planet. But take care of ourselves first. You know, so then we better look to, able to take care of other people and the planet. And just being vulnerable again. I don't. I, but I love Brene Brown. You know, I thank God for TED. You know, where would we be without yeah. TED talks? You know. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, and this uh, maybe leads to my second question. It's kind yeah. of general. Um, it's, it's uh, what are your personal um, philosophies regarding grief and loss, and how do you think it's similar or different from maybe what is normally thought about uh, grief and loss in our society? No, okay, you open that door, did you? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> number one, and uh, I got criticized for this many years ago uh, when I first started talking about the five stages of death and dying by Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Sure, sure. Um, and, and I said, well, you know, I just don't agree with those stages. I, I, I said, you know, I, and there was no, hardly any books out in 1987. And when, you know, that was one book by Kubler Ross yeah. um, that I, I read. And, and then to start the, the five stages, DABDA, it's acronymed, you know. And I, and I said, you know, when my son was diagnosed with cancer, I went through it. I went through denial. I went through anger. I went through bargaining. You know, I went through depression. It's real. And then I went through acceptance. Okay, let's fight. I did. That was perfect. Because Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did her study with the dying, not the grieving. And so but our country applied her five stages of death and dying, carte blanche, to five stages of grieving. It, she, even, she knew about it. I mean, I have a friend of her, a good friend of mine that's a friend of Elizabeth, was a friend of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And she, and she was with her before she died. And she was with Elizabeth. And, and Elizabeth, was, you know, quite a character. And, and, and she said, so, Elizabeth, tell me about the five stages. And she, she took a drag on her cigarette and her Swiss German accent. When are they ever going to get over those five <laughs> flipping stages? And she didn't say flipping. And, 
<laughs> so well, now, 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 like when I talked to the president of, of ADEC, they said, you "No, know, I know that they, they're pretty bad, but that's old school." You know, they, no, they don't. They were for the death of dying, not for the brave, mm -hmm. because people were trying to apply themselves. And if they didn't have anger, or they didn't, they didn't bargain, or they didn't believe in God, who they're going to bargain with? They, they felt out of place. Like they, you know, maybe I'm not grieving correctly because I didn't go through the stages in a linear progression. Oh, sure. So there's that pressure of like I didn't do it right. I didn't do it right because I'm supposed to go through here. Because if you know, if if you're a mechanic or you're an engineer, you know the stages of linear progression leading to a another outcome. You have to build one upon the other, upon the other, upon the other. You can't skip one in a turbine engine. You have to go from, you know, you have to go like that. So when you stay, it's the first stage, second stage, third stage. And so people think, well, I have to go through these stages that are built. No. So I came up with a, who know, a, a whole new modality that I started working with brief parents because it worked, seemed to work with them. And now people are, I'm talking about in, all over the country, and people really like the new modality because it kind of re it replaces the the Kubler-Ross modem, you know, that sure. is so user friendly, and I call it the stairs model. Okay. It's S T A I R S. It's an acronym. I love I love acronyms because they're a mnemonic tool to remember stuff, you know. And when you're in grief, you got C R S. You can't remember stuff. Can't remember, yeah, stuff. You know, and so <laughs> it, because when you're in stress, when you're in flight or flight response, your frontal lobe locks up, and you can't think. You don't even know your passwords and you're grieving. My God, you have to write everything down. You can't remember passwords. You can't remember your phone number. You'll be driving and not even sure where you're going. And then someone asks you a question, you get emotional and you lock up. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, it, it's, um, uh, where am I? I forget where I was. I was going on Stairs. That. Huh? Stairs. On the stairs, yeah. yeah. So uh, with the stairs, uh, it's just a, uh, kind of a user friendly. So instead of being a, a linear progression, uh, it is just more, uh, uh, experience. Uh, th this is, you can go up and down the stairs, you can sit on one stair, you can skip a stair, you can go to the top of the stair, you can come back down the stairs, because in grief sometimes, every day is like Bill Murray's Groundhog Day. Every day you wake up and your eyes go, oh no, my loved one's dead. It's another no whole, whole day of pain till I go to sleep again at night. And in the beginning, it's like that every day. You wake up every morning and you realize it's real. And so it's just over and over and over and over. Uh, so, in, in the stairs modality, the, the first, the first st step is stairs, not a stage, it's a step. So it, it's shock. Ask yes, for shock. It's universally what we go through, body, mind, and spirit, and soul. We go into, our body goes into, so we are numbed head to toe with cortisol, we can't, you know, we, how, do we, how do we go through the funeral? How do we take care of, pick out flowers and pick out psalms and, and do all these things? And we talk people are at the funeral and people come up and say, Oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Oh, I'll be okay. And you're you're giving them compassion. You're giving them strength. And how do we do that? We're broken inside. We're, we're just autonomic. We're just in we're so filled with hormones, we're just in shock. Yeah. I mean totally. That's it. We're numb and to soul. And and we just function at a, at, a, at a level just to get through. Some people even laugh at funerals. I mean, they start giggling, you know, and they can't stop themselves. And it's just because it's, it's nervousness and it's just you're in that, 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 that shock. So the shock starts to wear off. And when the shock stuck, it's like being frozen. Or in Minnesota, when you frostbite, you know, it, you don't feel a thing. But when it starts to thaw out, it hurts like hell. You know, I, have you been in frostbite or have you ever, your it's nose, your fingers, or, and, it get, and it just burns and it's hot and it's prickly and it's very uncomfortable. And if you, if you do a lot, you know, it, it's, it's, even, it's worse. So gr grief, it, grief is dependent. It's, um, directly correlated to the amount of love you put into a relationship, the grief is going to be directly correlated. That atten intense love of a relationship, you can have intense grief. If you have just a minimal relationship, it may not be as intense, uh, depending on the age in the relationship. So anyway, everybody universally goes into shock. And when that shock wears off, then you enter into the T, the trauma. Full-blown trauma. The nothingness is worn off, the shock is worn off, the reality becomes real. And you go, this is just my life now. And it's, 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 it's horrendous. And a lot of people stay in that, in that trauma the rest of their lives. Some people don't get out of the trauma. Um, uh, they just they, they stay broken. And cause until they get to the third step, which is acceptance. It's S-T-A-I-R-S. So when you get to the third step of acceptance, uh, that's where you really start to move forward. And ver verbiage is important. We never say move on, but move forward. Yeah, move forward. We all move forward. 
move on implies that you're moving beyond it, and you're over it, and you're never over it. But you move with it, you move forward. And I would like to come back to that. I, mm -hmm. I, I want to finish the, the acronym, but um, yeah. like the moving on, because I think it's, I think like uh, it's considered a good, uh, a good part, a, a successful grieving to actually move on to break those bonds. I think that's kind of traditionally in this country been kind of like what you're supposed to do. And it seems like you don't agree with that at all. No, not just the verbiage. It's moving forward, moving forward, because it, it, it's so empowering when someone says to you, uh, you know, God, you're moving forward. But if someone comes up and says, you've got to move on, it's like you're, you're dwelling. And maybe you have a picture in the, in the hallway. My son's picture is still in the hallway for 30 years. And people will come over and say, you know what, maybe you should take that time. It's time to move on. No, it's not time to move on. You don't move, move on. You move with. You move forward with. And so there's different in vocabulary in how you say it. So move on and move with, move forward are completely different things. And so it's just yeah. training people to say, well, and I, I was going to say too. So I think some people really, truly believe you should move on. Yes, and you know, some like people do. All the memories. Oh, which, yes. Yeah. Like like yes. That you know yes. Fear. And that is the most painful thing a, a bereaved parent, especially, can hear from family members. You got to move on. And that means because they think, oh, you got to. No, no, we don't have to move on. We, and I always, I tell the what people say. Well, I had a, my son died. His name was Kelly. You know, I'm telling people to say no. I, now I say, I have a son, his name is Kelly. Is and was is hugely different. When you say, I have a son, his name is Kelly, yeah. It's like he, he's at college or he's in heaven. I have a son, always. That I, that I, not that I can't, I didn't used to have him, and his name is, always will be Kelly. My grandchildren talk about Uncle Kelly all the time because he's, we keep him a present part of our life. And people would say years ago to my sister, you better move on and get over it, get over it, move on. And, you know, Clive Kelly always, part of your life. I said, just like my daughter's part of my life, he'll always be part of my life. Because he died doesn't mean that he doesn't have to be part of my life. But that's a hard psychology for people to take. They, they think, oh no, we got to bury their, their, their life with their body. And I resurrected, I did for five years my son, I resurrected him like Lazarus. I said, bullshit, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm bringing him back. I'm, and that brought me back because I was dead to the world for five years. I'm an artist. I couldn't do any drawings. I couldn't do any painting. Everything in my white world was black and white. And I, and I still don't do black and white. I don't, I, I've been doing black and white drawing, which is a good thing. I'm a portrait artist in, in pencil, but I couldn't do anything in color because I was like Pleasantville. It was, the movie, I was just, there was no color in my life until I brought my son back and like the rose in Pleasantville. When I fell in love again, I fell in love with my relationship with my son and then the colors started coming back in my life all over the place because I didn't have to let him go. I had a dream that when I was coming back uh, after he, um, after Kelly had died, we uh, I was coming to, a, um, we were flying to my, my in-laws were going to meet us, and they had our daughter. And back then at the airport, you could see the glass, you could see people, the people I actually could wait for you, you know, so they're up there, my mother-in-law and my daughter. And I'm on the plane, my wife and I were flying back, our son has died, and I, all of a sudden I just, I had this vision, you know, I'd like almost everything closed out around me, I could hear people talking, and I thought, what's going on with me? And then I, because I was looking up at her, but then I could, I could see my son, uh, his face is beautiful, like in front of my book, beautiful big face on a kite up in the sky, this beautiful sky, and I'm holding on to this kite. I can see the muscles in my arm, I'm just holding on to this kite real tight, and I'm looking at my daughter, and I see her up at the, in the through the thick glass, and I go, Kelly, I gotta let you go, you know, because that's what I was told, you know, you gotta let go, you gotta move on. And so I let go, and I said, "Okay, I can, I got to, I got to give everything to Megan now." And I let go, and the guy just stayed there, and he just smiled. <laughs> I, yeah, I was holding on so bloody hard, and, and I didn't have to. So, because he's always there, so I don't have to hold on to a memory. I can live with his being, his who he is, and that's not putting it behind me. That's just living with it. And so I, I had done it before. My do father died at 15. I, you know, I put it away, like my mom said. I didn't talk about it. I didn't cry. When my twin sister and her two sons were killed in a car accident, I put it behind me. I didn't talk about it. And that was my twin sister, and that's another whole subject. And then when my son died, I was just on overload. I couldn't, I couldn't take it. So I had to, I, and I said, I can't live without him. And so it's so powerful to make it, bring, keep them a part of your life. And people are going to look at you as being lugubrious and, and over the top in your grief. And, and you're talking about everything you do is about your son. And even my daughter, I uh, had said, Dad, I, 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 Kelly was sick for so long. 
And she goes, and then he died. And I thought, I could finally be center of the universe because everything was about Kelly when he was sick. And then he died, and it's still all about Kelly. You and your living, you're living with loss, and Kelly is always here. And, and um, then she went, and I, I, I know, hon, I, and I, I, I was a broken parent, and I didn't know what to do. But then when she became a mom, and she said she came to a conference with me for the first time. She said, "Start crying." And she said, "Dad, I I get it now. I get it why you and mom were so screwed up for so long." I should go. I get it. I'm a mom. I couldn't I couldn't do it either. So you did such a wonderful job with me. I really appreciate it. So I mean, it takes experience to realize to see where you are and where you've been to really kind of narrow it down. And so that that was a long yeah. I, I, I did get back to the acronym, but I mean, did I answer your question? Yeah. Well, yeah. Why, why why do you think it's so important for us to to, to bring uh, our, our, our lost you know, loved ones with us, you know, when, when they when they die, um, or what? Maybe a different way to phrase it is, what do we lose if we don't do that? If we try to leave them behind? Well, again, it depends. It depends on the um, the loss too, you know, and especially with with a child because you talk about your children all the time, and so you you never do. And there's no reason we have to. With a, with a spouse, maybe you get married again. You have the opportunity. You know, I don't think a new spouse would like the picture of the ex-spouse hanging in the, in the house all the time. So that, that's a, there's a difference there. Um, you know, and so it, because working with the bereaved parent for so many years, I saw so many people were so unhappy and so pigeonholed that they couldn't talk about their child. Now it's just huge. The horse is out of the barn. People are talking about their love and all the time. I mean, they brought their life back. They, 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 they hold grief and sorrow at the same time. They, they're not just gonna. So they're they're still talking. And some people are still gonna judge them, saying they're not over it. They should move forward. They should move on in their life. But if it's not hurting anything in their life, if they're keeping it on par with the rest of their family and their jobs and everything's functioning and they're happy and they're talking about their loved one, it works for them. And some people maybe shut everything up. Some people will clean the whole room after the after the loved one's done, whitewash the walls. It's over. They don't talk about it ever again. And that's okay. That works for them. There's some people will have a. a a, a shrine built in their house and never clean the room. The, the, the shoes are still half under the bed and everything is the same and for 20 years. And that's fine. That's what works for them. No one can say that you should really clean that room out and put it away. Or that, you know, why do they clean the room the day after? You know, everybody's going to judge you. You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. So you do what works for you. What psychologically works best for you so you feel, you don't feel the stress of the grief. Because the stress doesn't go away, and so it's processing, and that kind of all goes back to that acceptance. On the stairs, is that is, is you you don't accept the loss. I mean, no, everybody will say I don't I don't accept the death. I don't accept the murder of my child. I'll never accept. I, I was in Newtown three times. Those parents don't accept the, the murder of their children. Sure. But I said, but you can on the stairs. You can accept the challenge to survive. Like the president accepts the. Uh, the, general, the presidency. He doesn't agree necessarily with politics, but he, adjust, he he accepts the position. So we accept the challenge. Not their death. We'll never accept that, maybe. But we can accept the challenge. Because we become their legacy. We become their voice. And we keep them alive in the world with our actions, with what we do, with what we say. That keeps us alive. And that's what it's, I talk about turning loss to legacy. And that's what's so important, like keeping my son alive with the legacies I do. That I, I started giving blood the minute, uh, I mean, after he died. I said, you know, I want to give every drop of blood I want to give the legacy to my son. That other kids are dying and people need blood. And if I can help them survive, that's a legacy to my son. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I'm going to give blood as much as I can. And so I just did, gave blood. Oh, my gosh. They kind of screwed. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it went in the wrong. Anyway. Uh, it, it, I, out of 240 donations, I ha this has happened, but because uh, I've given 42 gallons of blood in my son's name, and they said that's helped almost a thousand people live or extend their lives. Each one is a is a legacy to my son. So that's the positive benefit of keeping someone's memory present and alive. It's a tribute to their life. Uh, it's a legacy to your life. It helps other people, and it keeps them. It, it's a win-win. You know, if, if people don't think you're over the top, you're not over yet, well, that's, you know, we lose a lot of friends in grief because people want the old Mitch back, people want, you know, and, and that, he's not coming back. You know, I lost a lot of my buddies, you know, because I, I couldn't go golfing anymore. I, you know, I, I found out a relationship was based on a six-pack and, and, and not on emotions, you know, and, and um, 
but now some of the deeper friendships I have in my life are other bereaved parents. I'm like, uh, you know, is there just, because we, we cut through all the crap. You know, we, we get it. We just talk. We 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 laugh louder. We uh, we we we, uh, we make decisions uh, uh, quicker. You know, uh, not it's not initially. But we don't sweat the small stuff, and we don't and get anxiety over the big stuff. You know, you just say, live life for the day. Take baby steps. Mm. You know, and and sure. yeah. <laughs> so that that that's the acceptance. Okay, I accept. It. I'll take the challenge. Now what? Now where do we go? You know, I, I accepted it. Well, it's just empowering to accept it, for one thing. You say, oh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, I want, if I can create a legacy, that'll give me motivation to get off the couch. So I won't have the apathy. Well, I'll do a balloon release next week. I'll do a butterfly launch. I'll, I'll uh, uh, those friends in, in, in Chicago, my son-in-law went, we went to visit them, you know, for Thanksgiving. We went down to visit them on Thanksgiving Day. We wanted to recreate plane, trains, and automobiles. Because my son saw that movie the day before he died, uh, we went to see that. He laughed. It was the last time I heard him laugh. And he loved John Candy. And we, we loved that movie. And so we, went, we, we took the train to Chicago, and we flew back, and we drove while we were there with our friends in Chicago. And we arrived on Thanksgiving Day at their home. So it was, it was just, it was just uh, really a, a cool scenario to, uh, to, to, um, to recreate. Um, Oh, no, I, I, was gone. I, I start getting into that whole... Empowering accept, acceptance? Um, yeah, well, oh, yeah. Yeah, to accept. Though they... What, to, and what everybody's journey is different. I guess what I'm saying is how everybody accepts the journey and what they do. Okay. They, they attributed me to helping them so much that I gave them a, a light to shine, just a little crack of light, and they just went with it. And, and they said, you don't judge us, you know? They, they have Christmas. It's been six years since their, their daughter died. She died two weeks before Christmas. Now, Christmas never came. So they never took Christmas down. Their house has Christmas stuff all over. And, it, and we've been there several times, and they, we function around it, and, and it's just part of their life. They don't say, oh, look at this or anything. It's just part of their normal decor. And they say, oh, we're gonna, you want to go? We're going to say hi to Jess. So, and they, Jess is in the, in the uh, their daughter, Jess, is the graveyard just down the street from their house. And they go there every single day. They have for six years. They go. I, I went with them, and my son-in-law was thinking this is really bizarre that people are still, you know, grieving over there uh, and going to the cemetery every day, and, and the house that's full of all this Christmas stuff, you know. And yeah. so um, we go to the cemetery, and my son-in-law's with, and and we're going to the grave. And, they, and they, he bought her some milk duds and put it on the gravestone, you know. And he was taking down some other lights they had, and, and he put a bottle, a can, an old can of uh, Mountain Dew that she loved, and took that away and cleaned it up. And then, okay, looking good. Good. See you, honey. Bye. See you later. And we took off. And my son, oh, he's talking to her like he's real, you know. He, and he wasn't crying. He wasn't all hanging over the gravestone. He was just saying hi to his daughter on his way to work. You know, and people would think that's nuts, but it's not. I validated that it's not nuts for them. That this is okay. This works for you. Not everybody could. I haven't been to. The, my, I even, my, we sent my son's ashes to Hawaii because he wanted to throw a firecracker in Mauna Loa when we were out there when we were sick. And he said, so I said, well, okay, Kelly, we'll, we'll send your ashes to Hawaii. So when he died, we sent his ashes to Hawaii, and some friends flew up over to Mauna Loa and dumped his ashes into Mauna Loa. Oh, wow. So we haven't got a, a, a gravestone. And I, I don't even see my dad's gravestone. I can't, I don't, they're not there. I just don't like that. But, and so we're completely different in that respect. Sure, sure. But we're still dealing with our grief, and we're still finding joy again. It's just different paths to get there, because it's all different side roads to get on the main road to find joy again. It's our birthright. And when you're, you feel guilty when you're feeling joy and grief. And so you don't yeah. allow. That's why I'm saying be vulnerable to the pain, but be vulnerable to the joy. When that laugh comes, don't hide it. When the tears come, don't hide it. If you can't, if you, and a lot of men can't cry, you know, or you know, have trouble. We have smaller tear ducts. We have less prolactin in our system. So it's even more challenging for us to cry. But, like I was, I think I mentioned neuroplasticity, you know, that we, we can retrain our brain. And uh, I was not a crier. I never cried at my dad's funeral, you know. But I, when my son was like, I was just, I could feel I needed to cry. Was just, you feel this tension building up inside. And if someone's not there to say the right thing or wrong thing to you, to let that, to burst that boil and let it all out, 
I would rent a whole Hallmark movie. I'd just start watching the commercials and I'd just start bawling it. Now I can't watch a Hallmark movie without crying uh -huh. because my neural pathways are there now. So it's allowing me to cry. I cry much easier than I ever did before. Okay. I missed up so easy because I've got new pathways that allow that. They've become the default instead of the, 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 the stoic macho you know, and because we can't change, you know, personality. I'm, I, I've inter interviewed a lot of brief parents, and have your personality change? Every single one. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> you can tell by their body language. They, oh yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, because they know they, they they're not that the person they used to be. So that's accepting that challenge. When you get that challenge, then you go to the eye of the upstairs, and you go to the introspection, the insight, and intuition, and you depend on those things. You look to yourself and find out, oh my God, I got talents. I got depth that I've never explored before. And so you find these things that, wow, I, I didn't know I could do all these things because you, you never really had to. So you really find you're a lot like the um, Christopher Prue, was it uh, Christopher Robin said to Winnie the Pooh, you're stronger than you think, braver than you. I wish I could remember how that goes. Anyway, there's three things. Stronger than you think, braver than you. You're stronger than you think, braver than you. Uh, I have it written in the next room, but. Um, smarter, maybe. smarter than you think, braver than you know, and yeah, anyway. the more I keep trying to do it, but uh, yeah, you, you find out that you do. Yeah, you are stronger than you ever thought you would be. You are getting through this. I remember when I wrote my book, Letters to My Son, and I wrote him on the third letter about three months out. I said, hey, guys, it's not so bad. I'm going back to work. I'm, you know, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. It's, uh, you know, I'm, really, I'm doing okay, and no reflection on you. I still love you. Within six months, I read the letter and said, Kelly, I want to walk in front of a truck. I want to be with you. I, I, I don't want to leave your mom and your sister, but I, right now I don't care. I just want to be with you. And so that show six months later, I was just in, I, I never knew what depression was. I thought it was a mind game. And I said, oh my God, I, this is depression, I guess. And, and it was grief depression, which is different from clinical depression. Grief depression is, it, it can happen minutes or days or weeks. I mean, it comes and goes and comes and goes. And you're always p crying about your loved one. Clinical depression, you, you don't, you, you don't, you don't, you don't, um, you are so depressed that you don't even think about your loved one as much as you think, you know, that's why a lot of depression is confused with sadness, that you think I'm depressed because I'm sad and I'm apathetic and I'm missing them. When you're clinically depressed, you don't give a rat about anything. Yeah. You know, you're just, you're not thinking about them, you're not thinking about what you're going to do, or you're not crying because you miss them, you're just, that, and that's when you need to seek professional help. But if it comes and goes, you know, that's just, so a lot of people, it, it, I'm depressed. Well, maybe it's just sadness, but it, it comes. And, and we look at it as depression. It's grief depression. It comes and goes. But clinical depression is another thing that may require uh, medical help. But if it goes on too long, it can become. Just like isolation. If you isolate yourself, that's okay. I don't want to get off the couch. But if it comes three, four weeks, then it becomes agoraphobia. And you, you're just not, don't want to social react with anybody. And that, and we don't, we're herd animals, and we, we, we need people, yeah. or we'll go bloody crazy, yeah. you know, that's why hermits are crazy, you know, I mean, not, no, I'm not talking about anybody in particular, but, you know, if you're, you, I'm, I, I need people, I know that, if I'm on the farm too long, I need to get out with people, and so that, that is that, that when you find out, that, <laughs> going back to the stairs, but the, the AIRS, when you find out what talents you have, you go, now what do I do with them? I'm going to rebuild my life. That's the R. I'm going to rebuild my life. Experience a renaissance in my life. A rebirthing, a restructuring. A, uh, and it, that's the, I, so you find, oh, God, I got these talents. Now I can rebuild my life. Then if you can rebuild your life, maybe you'll get to the S, which is serenity. It gives you a path. It gives you the S to go, the, the shock to start off with, and a goal of serenity. And anywhere in between, you can be up and down. You you know you you, you know you, you can be bad. You can be diet square one and shock one day, one morning. You know you hear another news or have another loss, and it, 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 it can you can backtrack right back again. Or you've had cumulative losses you haven't processed, and then you have that one more that just puts you in overload and you're 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 gone. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I had physical ailment in my throat that I could not lump in my throat that I could not get rid of after my son died. It was about a year after his dying. And, and my doctor said, quit drinking, quit uh, smoking, lower your stress. Yeah, easy to say. Sure. You know, and he said, put, oh, we put you on some Valium and antidepressants. And I said, no, I don't want, I want to feel the pain. I don't want to mask the pain. I want to experience it. If you don't experience it, it's going to come get you sometime. You can take, you can take some things that will delay it. Uh, 
but it, it's, it's still going to come back to bite you. You know, so I, 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 I just wanted to experience it without anything. So he just said, well, do all these things. So I did. I restricted everything, you know, but I still had it. And I just, oh, it was driving me crazy. So I heard about a rebirther because I'd taken my son to a rebirther uh, when, he, when we were in California. And uh, it was just kind of a, you know, she was out in Hudson. Anyway, I saw it in, in a little fish wrap at a gas station, you know, and advertised rebirther. I said, I know what that is. I was in California once. And <laughs> so I went to this lady. I said, okay. I said, I, I want to, I got to get rid of this lump. I, and so I talked to her and she said, and she did this breathing technique. It's all about breath. And, and so she just held my hand and did this breathing technique and went through this whole process and breathing and then all of a sudden, bam, I, uh, I heard the furnace click on in the next room like that. It was in like, the basement. And I, I had a basement room when I was a kid and I was right next to the furnace. And I was, I, my dad died. My mom came down and says, your dad died at the hospital. You're the man of the family now. And I was back then. I heard the furnace click on. I started bawling and crying for my dad because I never did, ever cried for him. So I started crying. Oh, and, oh my gosh, I said, scared the wits out of this woman. And I laughed. She goes, come back for another couple sessions. And I, I, I go home. I said, oh, you've got to be kidding me. You know, this hurt way too much. No, I can hardly talk now because I was screaming so much. But the next morning I woke up, gone, it was gone completely. And I thought, oh my God, it, it, it's gone. I think I had to go back and express the grief of my father, which I never expressed, so I could live with the grief of my son. I know, because it was caught in the it's like East. It was almost physical manifestation. It was a physical manifestation. In, a, in, a, in Eastern philosophy, it's the throat chakra. You know, throat chakra is blocked. You're not expressing that anger and that rage. And so it's all being held in. And that's the, the mystical, esoteric side, that is the chakra. But it's also the hormones that you're, that you're, that you're, that are the stresses, the stress hormones are, you know, whatever you, are you nervous or you're angry, what do we do? You gulp. It's a normal reaction. We melt, especially men. We, we gulp to hold it in. We swallow it. We actually physically swallow our expression. And when you're doing that all the time, and then you have other hormones that are, that are trying to help and relieve the stress, they're in conflict all the time. So you, you get the, I read, finally read, late, years later, I found out about this conflict in the throat, and I said, that's what I had. And I was just attributing it to my throat chakra. But there's a physical, so that all goes hand in hand, whether it's spiritual or physical. That's why I talk about the four, pillars of equilibrium because they all it all makes a difference all four areas of our life um it's uh sometimes i can't write and talk at the same time um uh, it's gonna you're, you're mentioning like you know uh, some stuff out of eastern philosophy uh and that's actually one of my questions too i was wondering if you have learned uh, or what you've learned about grief from working with you know either working with or reading about you know think different cultures or different uh, uh yeah grieving from different cultures or different ways of life, uh, different types of spirituality. Um, yes, yes. I've read a, heavily a lot of, because I was exploring everything in the early days, so it worked. You know, I've read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and I've read uh, the Koran, and I've read the Bible, and I've read, you know, I've read all sorts of esoteric texts, and, and um, channeled information, you know, I've read, I read, you know, everything I could, but then when I go back to the ink, nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. We just keep reinventing it, or relabeling it, or whatever, but so a lot of those basic concepts, um, go back a long, long time, and I found a lot of uh, help in those, because they're, again, it's the KISS method. It's, let's keep it simple, silly. Oh, Just sure. <laughs> go back to the basics, you know, and, and so, yeah, the Native American uh, culture was huge for us, uh, for my wife especially. Um, and the Hindu and philosophy and all the Eastern, I've been studying for years, and I, I read Ram Das, and I love Wayne Dyer's philosophies, and, you know, I was a, you know, the old Back then, they call it the uh, um, all the New Agers, all the New Age philosophy. So I, I've been reading that stuff before my son was, had died. Okay. So you know, I, I was well versed in Eastern philosophies, and so I, I had I knew there's a there's so much about balance and body, mind, spirit, and soul that they that they all that they all go together. Uh, but after Kelly died, then um, well, the Native American was really uh, I just. I, again, I felt this intuition, felt this draw, you know, and I read an article about Chief Amos Owen down in Harriet Island, or um, Prairie Island, Hastings, that uh, was, was, was opening a sweat up for non-Native Americans. And I said, perfect, I want to go, because I heard about the powerful things they did with sweat lodges with Native Americans used under 
heroin and getting off drugs and very powerful uh, sweat lodge ceremony. And, and I'd read about sweat lodge and I said, oh, this opportunity, I get to go, you know. And, and uh, so I went met with Chief and, and my wife was going to come. Went down there, she wanted to go. And, and uh, we got there and they're preparing. The, and, and they said, well, we got so many people out, we're going to have to do two sessions. And also we want to know, is anybody, any of the women here in their phase of the moon? <laughs> and I said, honey, and she goes, oh, shh. I said, no, this is bad mojo, you know? <laughs> you know? And they said, no, it's really bad for the chief, if, if, you know, so the women are excused from the ceremony. So she was, had to leave. Yeah. was not happy. <laughs> and so I stayed, and uh, I drove her home, and, and then I came back for the second session. So I came back and I'm waiting to get in. I got in the session and, and again we do. You sit in this tent with all the rocks and you, you pass the calumet, the pipe with the kinnik kinnik in it, and uh, and then you say a prayer. You say matakwayesin, pray for all my relations, and then you ask for your personal prayer. And so I did, uh, and I said, uh, grandfathers, please. You know, the seven grandfathers coming to the tent with the seven stones that are in there. So I said, grandfathers, please bring Kelly to to Barb my wife she needs to see her son one more time and she just I don't know how to help that help her and so then we went around the circle then I, I got out and I just wow it was just a powerful experience I felt so many things in there I can't, I can't even articulate it some of that spirit language you just can't anyway I come out and I'm just sitting there just I, I felt so good and I went home I felt so relieved and I come home I, about 11 30 and my Wife comes up with it. She goes, I can't wait for you to get out. She goes, how was this wet? I go, what are you still doing up? She goes, I went, I was sound asleep. But then at right about 11 o'clock, right at the time that I had asked the grandfathers to bring her, Kelly, she said, I heard Kelly calling my name. And she goes, I went on the deck and I, and I, and I could almost see him in the clouds coming down. I opened the glass door and I said, Kelly. And, he, and I, could, she, I could feel his, smell him, feel him. And he said, I love you, mommy. And then he was gone. And she said, so that just was huge for her. So she, it, it just, that, that changed the pivotal point in her grief that she got to hug her son one more time, all from the Native American spirituality. So that I went out and I went out and I went to Pipestone, Minnesota, which you can't do anymore. And I bought a piece of a pipe and I saw the horse head in it. And then I, I carved a horse head. I went and got a willow bar or a sumac branch and I made the, the other part of it, put it together. And a friend of mine gave me an eagle feather. She worked at the Carpenter Nature Center, all these things together. And I made my own calumet and I still have it. And it was so, and then I met a Native American helping him deal with the loss of his son. And I went up to North Dakota. To, to Bismarck and, and spent time with him and it was his son it was his stepson and he said no one was acknowledging it and his wife was even kind of upset that he was so upset about his son when she's the mom and so I became like a really support since we I got a whole book probably of uh, uh, the letters from Robert Baker we just we communicated back and forth he came down here one and he brought me I'll show you when we leave he made me because you talk about Indian giving you know that that's that whole stupid thing that white man came up with about the, in, the negative Indian giving it's just when you give a gift you give another one back you know so I, I, I had a piece of uh, uh, pipestone that I gave to him I said here you can see that what's inside of this stone you carve what you need and here I'm giving an Native American pipe stone, which you can't get anymore. <laughs> and and I gave him the eagle feather because I'm not supposed to. You're not supposed to carry an eagle feather unless you're Native American. So I gave him the eagle feather too. And then he gave me a wooden flute, and he made a, a buckskin. He had killed a deer, and he made a buckskin bag with beadwork on uh, and, and for the flute, and gave them both to me. And he came wow. down here one time. I never knew how to play it. He brought his pipe. We sat on that deck out there, and we both played. I'd never played in my life, and I was just following him. And uh, it, there's so much when you open the door to the things, the spirit. It just comes flowing in, you know, if you allow it. And so all these other religions are just trying to identify. They're it's honest. Everybody's trying to articulate something that can't be articulated, and it's why it's so different. It's, it's something that is felt more than articulated. And I think that's where we get in that sacred space in grief, that we, we are communicating on that spirit level, uh, where, it, where the brain, you know, even when we're in mass communication, we're communicating here today. Only 7% of what, well, we're probably doing more than 7% here because we're interviewing, is the oral word. You know, it's 55% is, is your body your body language and, and your, your volumetrics, your, your intonation, and all that. And there's another 38%. So, I mean, it's really, the, the word is so small. So when you're in a very sacred space, you're communicating all the time if you're receptive. 
and you walk away and you feel so good and you wonder why we really didn't say that much you know that's why less is more that's why psychiatrists get big bucks they don't say a word they just <laughs> listen you know and then they but they know how to they know how to give the feedback non-verbally and people are are feed the non-verbal skills so ver non-verbal uh or non-verbal communication is so important i think in grief because people so you, you want to give a hug you let people know you want a hug you know, because it, it, uh, you got to honor other people's space too. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's a hugger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I realize we're kind of. <laughs> Are we going? Oh, right, is, sorry. No, this is oh. really engaging. I just, but I'm realizing we're, we got down to like 15, 20 minutes. You know, okay. So, uh, so I'll just kind of move on here. Um, there's just so much I want to say. Oh yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I, I gonna shut up. So tell me to shut up anytime. <laughs> no, no, this is just really engaging. Um, uh, so my next question is, are there any factors that prevent a person from coping well with grief? And if so, uh, how is it different for people who experience more healing from grief? Mm. Uh. Read that again one more time. Yeah. Are there any factors that prevent a person, or, you know, yeah, factors that, uh, any factors that prevent a person from coping well with grief? And if there are specific ones, how is it different from people who, who experience more healing from grief? Yeah. Those yeah. It's uh, well, drugs and alcohol for one, you know, uh, can impede the because you're not feeling. It's disguising your emotions and can create other emotions. You know, with alcohol, it can be depressant, and you're already depressed, and it just increases your depression. Mm -hmm. um, and so those can be hindrances. Um, um, other limitations, even physical limitations that you have, and be able to, or geographic limitations, where you. Uh, it, it's getting better now with the internet that people, you know, can be connected to anybody almost any time. Uh, but when you're living way out in the country, you know, uh, and you don't have a group, group, there's no group to go to. Uh, you know, that, that that can affect the journey. If you have a, if you have huge responsibilities, and you lost a child, and you have 12 other children to take care of, you know, you, you put your grief on hold. You, you can't. You got to take. You got to take care of your other children. There's just no way around it. And so, so a lot of people get put their grief on hold, and then. You get so used to that new um, operating system that pretty soon it becomes normal, and that's all you know. And you, and you say, so I'll, I'll, I'll deal with my grief later. A lot of men will do that too. I'll take care of the family. I'll deal with my grief later, and you never get back to later. You know, you just you, and so there's a lot of things that can get in the way. I think the people that I see that are moving forward uh, and doing the best in their grief is people that are that are vulnerable. Are vulnerable to it all, just allowing it, you know, and 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 being and sharing their story with other people, and I think above all is uh, like Fran Saint Francis of Assisi said, "Make me an instrument of your peace." Doing something for others, you know, and that's why I start giving. When I start giving blood, my wife came back. I came back. She goes, "Why you look so happy?" I go, "I gave blood," and she goes, "Oh, yeah, I've never. I just fasted because I've seen you since Kelly died." And I said, I know, and they, I know they could do it every six weeks. And, they, and, the, and I said, I, 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 I got to go again. And so they said, apheresis, you can do every three days. That's where they put the needle in each arm. Oh. You know? And so I said, sign me up, because then I could go twice a month, and I could feel good twice a month. So it was selfish at me at first. I'm going to give blood because I feel better. Sure, sure. But the benefit was giving other people. So it's, a, it's, a, it's really a win-win. So yeah. it's what you're doing, but when you give, or you work at a church, or you open doors for people, metaphorically or physically, you know, and, and it just makes you feel better. Let, on, the, on the freeway, when you see people on road rage, de-escalate it. Let them in. Give them a peace symbol instead of the other one. You know, and, <laughs> and, and just give people parking spots. Uh, open doors for people at, at, all the time. You know, and you start to feel better because you're putting something out. You're not so self-centered on your, all your misery and your pain. You're actually doing something else. And that makes you feel better because it's an it's an autonomic it's again it's a hormonal response when you help someone else you know you feel better probably you know some of that neuroplasticity aspect too because you're kind of practicing kindness you're practicing, practicing kindness and kindness becomes your new modus operandi you know and that's the new neural pathways yeah yeah, yeah you're creating it you know and and we have the ability just like apes do you know and and when apes are picking themselves and do that they're both receiving and giving they love to get it and they love to do it they love to take yeah. care of each other and uh and said so, so you know, we are we are primates too, you know, and and um, the pr primates they're, they're saying they are they're, they're finding more and more, especially the, the chimpanzees, some of the relations, the emotions that they can experience that we experience. Uh, you know, not that we could probably learn a lot from them. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
next question, and we've covered this a little bit in some of what you've talked about and who you work with, but um, are there any specific types um, uh, of grief or loss that require the most help? Um, and why do you think that is? Uh, yes, because then you get into complicated grief. Catherine Shear, she's probably the biggest in the country about complicated grief. And uh, yes, and, and so when, like about well, suicide is complicated grief, or when you're involved in it, and so you put all your, your grief on the, on the side. That really complicates the journey. If you have multiple losses at the same time, uh, or if you had a, um, I know one young girl that, um, teenager, had a, her brother was killed at 18, and she was 16. And uh, she wanted to go with him when he was going out, and she wouldn't, and he wouldn't take her. No, I'm going out. He wouldn't take her. He'd go, oh, I hope you get killed in a car accident, you asshole. Oh, boy. And he did. He got killed in a car accident. She had a hard time living with that. She felt that she was responsible because she wished it on him. Did we know cognitively that a wish is not, that's not going to happen? You're not the cause of it, but you can't, you can't, we can't remove that guilt from her. And that's another whole subject. And that's where guilt, regret, and remorse uh, are stumbling blocks for the journey. Uh, the man in Minnesota that shot his own son turkey hunting. He'll never let himself off the hook. You know, he heard the brush and, he, and his son went the wrong way, but he shot his son. I've talked to his wife. His wife said he has not stopped drinking since. She goes to grief groups. He won't. He just sits and drinks. He will never forgive himself. And so there's some people that they're, it, it is just, they will not forgive themselves. And you can't take their grief away from them. You can't say, oh, you were a good father. You didn't mean to do it. You know, he did. He didn't mean to do it, but he did do it. You cannot remove the emotions from them. And some people will tend to do that. You know, it, and you know, it, but the one man that uh, he fell asleep on his baby and, and, and suffocated him. Now he speaks all around the country talking about do not lie down with your infants. So he's turning his loss to life and preventing deaths by embracing what happened and not beating himself up. He, he said, I live with the guilt. I have the guilt that, I, that my son died because of my actions. Uh, that's something I have to live with. But I'm going to move forward with him and, and as a legacy to him, help prevent other deaths. It kind of goes back to you know, doing something to help other people now, you know, becoming part of the story. That yes, yes. Yes, and telling and, and telling the life story, too, at the same time, is so powerful in, in grief. It's not only tell the death story about how they died, why they died, the complications, all the stuff around the death, but tell the life story. Tell the good things. Tell the jokes. Tell the human foibles they did. Laugh about them. You know, tell their life story at the same time. And that, I, I love when I, when I, I I'll instill to the people, I'll be at with the group and I start asking questions about their, you know, I said, you know, my, I didn't, I didn't realize, that, you know, why we went through so many hamsters and my son was dying until his best friend who asked me to be his best man at his wedding, which was huge for me all these years later, my son died at nine, his best man, uh, his best friend asked me to be his best man. But he said, you know why Kelly went through so many hamsters? I said, no. He said, he loved to throw them up on the ceiling fan. <laughs> <laughs> and I laugh so hard. It's, it's really cruel. It's not funny, but but what a great story, you know, about my son. It was just, and he was like that, and that was so Kelly. Of course, that, of course, he was doing that, you know. How can I be proud of your son for killing hamsters? But I was kind of. You know? <laughs> he sounds like he was having fun. He was having fun, you know. <laughs> yeah. And he had a brain tumor too. And you sometimes you have a little, you're a little darker. You know, it, it can cause pressure on different parts of the brain. He started swearing more and wearing black all the time, and you know, so he, his personality changed from the presence of the tumor. So you have to be aware of that too. That just like in Alzheimer's, when you're that's another whole slow death that they become someone they're not, and, and you grieving the person that was, and you're still living with the person they're becoming. And my father-in-law died of Alzheimer's. I mean Alzheimer's. So I was the last one he knew because. I didn't pretend, I didn't want, I didn't make him be, I, I was, I went with him. As he went, as he became back in the, in the, in the 40s and singing, I, I started playing Frank Sinatra and stuff for him. He loved it. we talked about it. He called, and I'd say, hey, Jackson, instead of Jack. No one else called him Jack or Dad. He wouldn't remember him, but I called him Jackson toward the end. He'd look at me, he'd know Jackson. He'd just, <laughs> he would get it. So I, I, I went to his level all the way toward the end. And it was great to see that happen. I didn't even know, but I started reading more research about that, that, yeah, they lose all those back file cabinets. So go, you know, go to the file cabinets where they're at. Don't expect them and get them. They get all frustrated when you expect them. You're not understanding me. And we, you know, that, so we have to go to the level. That's in grief, too. You go to the level of the person's at, where they're at. Meet them in there. Meet them where they're at in their grief. Don't expect, don't bring them and, and tell them where they should be in their grief. Just shine a light. Just shine a light for them. Um, 
So I've got, I've got uh, two questions left. Kind yeah. of, you know, we're kind of getting to that you know really specific question about my research study. Um, so the question is, uh, do you, do you um, ever see grief as a skill? And if so, could grief ever be uh, reimagined as a skill to be learned um, in our society? And then part two of that is, uh, do you think that would provide any, um, if people were to see grief that way, would it provide any um, utility in the work you do to frame it that way? Yes. Oh, totally. And it's, and it's, um, uh, it's happening. I mean, as we speak, that, that, that people are considering. Uh, uh, this friend of mine, he lost, his son died of a um, tonsillectomy, and uh, botched tonsillectomy. They had no idea, you know. He's four years old and from tonsillectomy and died, bled out. And they, they I think, that they did get some um, uh, settlement um, because it was a medical error. Uh, and so they channel all their energy and some of their, their money into creating the grief toolbox. And it's a, it's a huge uh, uh, wheelhouse online for anything grief, for uh, from making necklaces, ash, books, speakers, whatever on grief, whatever you want. He's created the grief toolbox, and the toolbox is a representation, of, of, you know, of tools. They were skills. You have to be skillful to use a tool. So the whole metaphor of the toolbox is is good because in order to use those tools, you have to be skilled at using those tools. And so to be skilled, we, I talked about the neural pathways, is rebuilding those neural pathways. Learn new skills uh, that you say, I can't, I can't, or I'll never will. Uh, I'll never get over this. If you keep telling yourself words are so powerful, if you say, keep saying, I'll never get over this, I'll never be happy again, you probably won't because words are real. So you, you, you talk about the, the, the moving forward. You talk, you, you, again, it's retraining. You learn the skills of working with other people. You know, it's communication skills. You learn how to talk to, to them and, and how not to talk to them. You thir learn not things to say. You, you, don't say com you don't say committed suicide anymore at all. People still do. I mean, parents who are, or people who have lost a loved one say committed. And it's, it's judging. It's putting a label of crime on it when all you have to say is died by suicide or suicided. My son died by cancer. His son died by suicide. There's no judgment. It's just staying the facts. But when you say, di uh, when you put the moniker of committed, it, di it just strikes people really, it hurts, you know, because yeah. you're judging them. Well, it sounds mm -hmm. like, what, you know, uh, kind of what you're describing here is like, uh, if, I'm, if, I, if I'm distilling it down correctly, it's, it, it almost, grief can almost make you much more s sensitive. Huh? Oh, yes. Much more sensitive and sensitive and much more articulate. You know, because you're trying to articulate something that is, like I said before, it's hard to articulate that, that feelings. And so you become a bit more adept and, and um, learn new skills. You read more, maybe. And you have a hard time because you've got CRS, it's hard to read. But you do. A lot of people are omnivorous readers. And they learn, and they're learning and doing things. Like when in, the, in the stairs, when you go to the eye, the introspection, that is searching for your skill sets. That is finding their skills. You don't know if you're skilled until you do it. Some people have natural skills. Some are artists. Some are technicians. Some are you know, whatever. But you don't know until you, until you actually go there and find out what your skill level is. And so, and once you find it and you get nurtured by it, then, then that pretty soon becomes the dominant pathway in your brain. And those old skills are... I, um, so, and I'm even doing an experiment um, called the 66 Day Challenge, and I started it January 1st, so I could really get s consecutive days, you know, so I know which day, I think day's 48 or 49, okay. and, and it was to reduce uh, my weight and my blood pressure, <laughs> and, and so I said I wanted, to, I, I wanted to get down to 180, and I wanted to keep my blood pressure under 150 over 90. Because that's the new standard is 160 over 90 for some my age. Again, there's so much blowing up in the medical. I mean, there's so much lies and junk out there. Um, <laughs> they just take care of yourself and find out what. So I take my blood pressure every day. I went off. I've lost 20. I'm down to 180. And so I've lost 25 pounds in 48 days. Oh, and, uh, um, it's, and so I'm, and I quit drinking. I love beer. I drink beer every day. You know, I, I don't consider myself an alcoholic. I just love beer. If I don't have beer, I don't look for the wine or the, or the tequila. I just drink tea if I don't have my beer, you know, but, uh, and I love beer, but now it's been 50 days and I, I haven't, haven't had any beer and it's, it's fine. I actually have more energy. My eyes aren't as dry. I'm actually finding the value of not having a couple beers every day. And, but it's now that it's ingrained, I, I, my wife had a beer. Oh, come on, honey, have a sip. I said, 
No, I don't want it. I, I, no, I don't even smell good. That's all new neural pathways. I, if you, because they did a study of people in 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 Europe that I don't know which country that, how many people could adopt a habit or drop a habit, and the average was 66 days that they adopted a new habit or dropped an old habit. Some went earlier, some went later, but the average was 66 days. So I read that study. I said I'm going to do a 66 day challenge. <laughs> it's actually be a 60 day challenge with six get out of jail free cards. So I had six days that. So you give yourself. You're your own boss. And so I had six days where I could drink if I wanted to. Someone stopped in one day. Oh, I'm going to have a beer with you. You know, there goes one of my days. And so I ran out of days, and I'm fine with that because it's a different mindset. I'm not drinking because it's just every day, and drinking because, well, I could or I don't. I, I got choices where I never thought I had before. I get home, the minute I do it, I will open a beer when I get home, because that is, that is the dominant pathway. Sure, sure. And so when, that, that's, a, that's a perfect example. Uh, and I did my whole diet that way too. So I'm eating blueberries and yogurt every morning, and then I, you know, I spinach. I look at all the food combinations that where you don't eat potatoes with meat. You don't eat meat and potatoes. That's our whole country is fat because we eat meat and potatoes, fries and a hamburger. For Christ's sake, yeah. you have your steak, but have a salad. You have a salad first because it it's neutral and you get high acid in your stomach, and meat needs high acid, and potatoes are are alkaline and they neutralize your stomach acid. You don't digest your meat. Eat your potatoes later. Or if you eat cold potatoes, they actually become a resistant starch. So like vis vichyssoise or cold potatoes, cold are, are, they slow down. They're good for you. So I'm, I'm investigating and researching what works. And pretty soon that becomes new neural pathways. And my body's responding quickly to it. And you, you, uh, it's, it's amazing, truly. I, I, it was kind of a, just a, uh, my experiment. But I really, wow, I, I, and my wife's not saying, well, I want to lose some weight too. And, you know, but I think I will keep it off. Not all their fad diets are all, you know, you do this, you do that. And, yeah, yeah. well, oh, when I get back, I can't wait till I have a drink again. But when you, just like in grief, you've got you, whole, a whole new skill set. I, 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 never, I never was a public speaker. I never wrote a book in my life. I never took any writing classes. I went to art school. I've been an artist and that. <laughs> it was just, yeah, that was just, you know, in recession for a while, my creativity. Uh, but when I, when Mother Teresa died and I wanted to do a portrait of her, it brought it back. And so then I started, and yeah. so then I started, and those neural pathways don't go away. So all my artistic pathways came back, I came back, I was using them in. Same with the, uh, the de dependency pathways, you know, that they're still there, they're just, they're just slumbering, you know, but do you really want to wake up, wake them up <laughs> again, or do you want to keep the new ones? So we have those we have those choices, and that's in grief. The biggest thing is we have choices. We have choice point where we can go from here or we can go from there. We have a choice point, and every choice makes a difference, you know. But you have the choice. You're in control. That is the whole soul part: body, mind, soul, and spirit. The soul is in control. Interesting, yeah. Because I was, um, 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 I was actually going to ask you, like, is there any kind of. Um in terms of thinking about grief as a skill, are there, are there any spiritual implications for this? Yes, and that's what's so important. Uh, what I talk about that is the is the four pillars of equilibrium, I call them. Body, mind, soul, and spirit. And I use a car for as a metaphor because that's the easiest way to explain it. Uh, I mean, it may seem pretty simple, but uh, your car is your uh, is your body. It's a vehicle that transports you from one place to the next. It's our vehicle, that we have a car. Then we have the, the ignition system and the motor and the computer system that drives the car. That's our brain. That's our intellect. That's what operates the car and, and makes it go. Uh, and then we have uh, gasoline, energy that we pour into the car. That's spirit. That's the energy from the universe or God or whatever you call it. Is that it, it's what a, that, that, that energy that animates us. So we have body, mind, and spirit. Then what is soul? Who's driving the car? We are. We listen to what our body's telling us when we get cravings and we're, what the body wants, um, and, and, we, and we, we try to listen to that, so we accommodate it. We listen to our mind, what it says, and we listen to spirit. We get that gut feeling, that, oh, you better do this or do that, and most of the time, mind takes over. We vibrate in mind, because we're so smart, I'm good enough, like, um, small, uh, Stuart Smalley, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. <laughs> I can figure it out because I'm smart. I have intellect. I'm intelligent. I went to school. I can figure this out on my own. Instead of your gut saying, you know, you really should go this way. Just do that. And your body's telling you, you got to drink more water, dude. You know, and you're not listening. No, I'm fine. You know, and, and, you're, and you're not fine. So when we have balance, 
balance, we listen to body, we listen to mind, we listen to, this, but soul is the one driving the car. So we make this, we put the brake, brake on, we apply the gas, we turn the signals, we listen to when the tires are getting low, we hear a ping in the engine, we make a decision. And we need the gasoline. We gotta stop and get gas once in a while. You know, and that's when we have to refresh with God or the energy of the universe. We have to tap into that, that, that continual source of energy that is always there. You know, that, and when your hair stands up on the back of your arms and stuff like that, those are little indications. It's, you know, the spirit is really kind of giving you that validation. You know, and it's, it, 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 you feel it. You get a whole rush down your body sometimes when you know it. You know, and I, I really felt this more, and, and this is so common in the grief world when you're working at these organizations that everybody's getting these tingles and the goosebumps, you know, and, and the hair comes up on their arms when, it, it, uh, when you get a sign from your loved one and they said, oh my God, a, a bird. I, I, this one little boy that I told, um, his, his brother had died, and I said, his brother was dying. I said, give him a sign. They came over to the house again. It's one of those things. They read my book, and anyway, I said he's dying. And um, but give him, a, tell him, make up a word, you guys, so that when when he when he goes to heaven, he can come back and give you to let you know how he's doing. And this kid was, who died was eight, and his brother. It was a week later after I told him this. I said, come up with a, a sign or a, a code word. And so then the boy, a week later, the boy died, and then three months later, the older brother, who was twelve, called me one day, so excited. He said. He said, you won't believe it. He said, I was having a Tyler day. I was crying in my room and missing Tyler so much. And I said, Tyler, I miss you so much. And a red-tailed hawk came and landed on my windowsill and pecked at the glass. And, and when, when, before he died, we said, I said, send me a red-tailed hawk. <laughs> <laughs> so this kid is knowing his brother survived death. He, he knows his brother sent him a sign. So his, his whole view of life and death has changed for the rest of his life, knowing that it does not end at the physical death. And that's all a choice point. That's a choice for people to believe or not. But it helps. And so when a body, mind, soul, and spirit, we can survive on a three-legged stool. Body, mind, uh, and soul. All bodies, mind's telling me, I'm feeding myself, I'm intellect, and I'm making all the decisions. There ain't no, there ain't no God. There's no one coming to tell me intuition. None of that. I can survive on that. And you can survive. But the joy is, I've, I've seen too many people that are missing that other, the spiritual component. And I'm not talking religion. So many people can, fi can confuse religion with spirituality. And, and when you say spirituality, the religious people horns you off. Okay, oh, you say spirituality. They kind of mock you. That, oh, you're yeah. spiritual. You're not religious. Yeah. Well, you know. It's, so I don't. You know, it's, I, it's just it's, it's it's just being. It's just being. Just <laughs> being. It does not spiritual. It's not religious. It's just being and recognizing that we are part of microcosm of the macrocosm. We are connected in energy levels. Everything's the whole world, the whole universe is a torus. It's just a torus that goes back and forth. It's a donut that just enfolds in itself continually, and we uh, we can't get out of it. And we're, we're different spots in that torus all the time. But every thought we have, everything it's said, is nothing new. It's all being connected together. Mm -hmm. So that that's where I find it enervating. That that uh, when you recognize that, that's where you start to feel good. That you know, because we lose control when we're in grief. Mm -hmm. And when we, we think we've lost control, and that's what soul does, when soul turns it over to spirit, it lets soul get out of the driver's seat and put it out automatic. You know, I just saw my, my da daughter parked her car last night. Unbelievable. <laughs> my wife had pulled up behind her like this, and we were going out to dinner, and, and she came back, and I said, she goes, oh, he goes, I'll never fit in there. And, and she goes, well, you, my husband said, remember you got the automatic thing? He put that thing in automatic, and that guy backed right in. Oh, Boom. wow. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But I mean, we have that ability to, you know, and because when we're out of control, it just, that's what's so frustrating. With type A people in grief, they really have a hard time. And a lot of times, and people that don't have that third, that fourth leg, the religious part, not the religious, but the spiritual part, or the, that connection to the universe part, that, yeah. our, our creator, whatever you want to call it. But it's very, very real to, uh, to the people I met and that, that, that have not had that peace. And there's, they seem to be much more bitter, you know. They just don't have the have the joy, and 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 I know people have changed churches completely, you know, and gone different religions. But that that doesn't mean that they're giving up on God. Or yeah. it's just God's just a name for that that energy. But it's a relationship. So uh, yes, it's, it's, I think it's a very important piece in the grief journey. You know, without it, you can survive. But it's just it's a okay, okay. It's a tough journey. Yeah. Um, so I got one question left for you. Um, and so 
uh, I think grief is often looked at in, in at least our American culture as kind of a deficiency. It's something that comes upon you, something really unwanted, uh, negative that you have to survive and get through. Um, so if we were to, if society was to start approaching grief as more of a skill, like some of the stuff we've talked about today, uh, what might that, um, what might that look like in society? How might that, how might that change society? How might that, how might that facilitate grief? I think for people that experience it would be enormously helpful. I always said we should have grief 101 in school. You know, we have a lot of young people dying of SADS, of the sudden adult death syndrome on the football fields and or in car accidents at prom night. And, and that's their experience. I've talked to these high schools. There, there's nothing taught, really. There's some basics in psychology, but there's nothing to talk about grief. So we need to get grief in the school. I think we should have uh, sign language taught at the elementary school level because communication is the biggest problem we have in this world. Everybody in sign language, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking. You can always get something across. Why don't we start early with grief education, sign language, get, give people skills immediately, grief skills, yes. We have lost every day. We lost them last minute, just a minute ago. That's grief. It's not as intense as losing a loved one, but we live with grief every day. So why aren't we giving skill sets to know that this is normal, that we're living with this? We get a toolbox huge for our car. For everything else, we get tools. Why don't we get to us for ourselves? It's interesting that you, 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 you say, you know, grief is normal because I think we kind of try to protect children from it and we try to protect people from yes. it. It's almost like it's something that is not normal. But and it's not normal. I know it is so normal. I love Mexico. They go to the, when they do the whole Day of the Dead. You know, they honor their loved ones every year and they, it's a big party and they, because death is a part of life. And I tell people, people say, oh, can I bring the child to your workshop? I said, yes. If they're not, if they're, if they're too old, if they're crying and they're going to disturb other people, or if they're three or four years old and they can't sit still for a while and they're going to disturb other people, please don't bring them. But if they're cognitive enough, they're seven years old, they're, and they know, and they're, they, they bring them along. And I've had kids ask some of the best questions. I said, we do a disservice in our society to insulate children from the grieving process. Mm -hmm. Because children, as you know, if you've ever had children, around children, they have the... They have the ears, most incredible hearing. They hear everything. You may think they're absorbed into their into their game and their phone or whatever, and you and mom and dad are arguing. They hear everything. When our son was sick, he heard all the conversations. He knew he was dying, no matter what we try to insulate him. So when it comes to the funeral, people don't bring the children home or they hush, 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 hush. Everybody's whispering when it's a part of life. Yeah, Grandpa died. We're going to go celebrate his life at the funeral. Bring them along. Let them say, you don't, you don't pick them up and put them in a casket and make them kiss grandma anymore. That was, that was back then, but maybe that, that was psychologically traumatizing for some kids, I'm sure. You know, but to normalize it by having the body on the kitchen table, uh, we had our son in our, in our living room for half a day. We had friends come over and say goodbye to him. He was on the couch. We normalized it, normalizing it for people. This is normal. It's a part of life. My, my grandchildren... Um, I call it proactive grieving. My granddaughter drew, drew a, a picture uh, her, when her um, um, uh, cat died. Emma, her cat died. She was going to school September last year. And, and over the summer, Grandma Clara, great Grandma Clara had died. Our two dogs that we had, one, our, 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 Cocker, our, our Bassett died of old age. And we had this husky that we had to put to sleep because he killed our goat. He got my goat. <laughs> <laughs> you really did. So I, we had to put him to sleep. Literally, <laughs> Literally got my goat. And so the um, and then uh, so the girls had the experience, and we have a pet cemetery up here. So the goats up here, the dogs are up there, the horses up there. And so they know. I, and I talk about Kelly all the time. Kelly's dead, but Kelly's part of our life. So they, we talk about Uncle Kelly. They love Uncle Kelly. And so my little, my five-year-old, she'll hug a tree, and she's hugging a tree one day. She's hugging. I go, "What are you doing?" She goes, and she was crying. She goes, "I miss Uncle Kelly." And she's never met him. He's been dead for 30 years. So, but she misses him because she feels him here. She feels him part of him. She misses the potential that she didn't have. So, I mean, because it's been such a part of our life. She said, well, I've never met him. And, and so it's, it's, very, it's a very uh, positive experience around that. And so when she drew this picture, uh, she came over and said, okay, well, she was going to school the first day of school. And uh, mom's holding her cat that she had gotten over the summer because we all the, they didn't have any animals. All our pets died. So mom said, get a cat. No, we're not getting a cat. You get a cat. So they got a cat. She's going to school, getting on the bus. Mom sets the cat down. The cat ran after the school bus and ran under the back wheels and was killed. 
and my daughter calls me and says, Dad, you're the grief guru. <laughs> what do I tell my daughter? And, and, and she, I said, well, tell her the truth. Tell her exactly what happened. I said, I, 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 we're, I'm tired of insulating our, from the grieving process. Tell her what happened. They hear everything. Don't make up some story. Don't hear from other kids or whatever. They're all, you know, so just, just be totally honest. So she got home, told her. She cried and cried about Emma. And she said, can we go bury that Papa's house? And so they did. So the next day, they brought her over to Shoebox and came over. And, and I burned some inse or some sage. And we did a little Native American ceremony to the four directions. And we made it a ceremony, which we're not doing as much either anymore. It's, it's you know, to really make it a ceremony and, and talk about the, the cat. And, and so we did. And then she came down. She drew me. Look at Papa. I drew a picture. And she drew a picture. And it shows Uncle Kelly with his bandana on and his Chuck Taylors, which why I still wear these 30 years later, oh. that um, we were bandana buddies because he had chemo. So um, now I'm bald, it still works. But she, um, she drew the picture of Kelly with, just standing there with his bandana and his tennis shoes on, on top, of the, on top of the earth with clouds all over it and the sun up here. And then showed a picture of Grandma Clara. And uh, then it showed a picture of, of Louise, our, the, the husky, and a picture of Lola. And then a picture of Emma um, up on a little separate cloud, um, right uh, on a big rainbow up toward the sun. And, and, she's, that, and she said, that, that, I said, I know I miss Emma. I'm so sad for Emma, but Uncle, Uncle Kelly's going to be so happy to play with Emma. And Grandma Clara loved Emma, so that's, that's okay. They, they get to have Emma, and I had her for a while. And, but I put her over here because I don't want her to get wheezy to get her. <laughs> <laughs> It's also she found like a lot of meaning in it. She's, yeah, yeah, and, and acceptance that this is a part of life. Death is a part of life. It's not scary. It's not, because we have, we have fear of what we don't know. We fear of the unknown. So when you know what, what's out there, we, it's not so fearful. And when you believe in a continuing existence, it's not as fearful. Most of the brief parents I've talked to, none of us have a fear of death. No, take me. I, I don't want to leave too early, but if I go, I certainly have no misgivings. And so we live for the day and enjoy it and, and look forward to that reunion. And if you don't have that feeling, it's, it's tougher. You don't think you're going to have a reunion. You're not going to see them again. You, know, you don't feel like you can talk to them without sounding like you're crazy. And so it, it just validates people that, no, you're not crazy. You're breathing. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think we, we, we ran through them. Oh, God, is there anything else I, I segued off that I didn't cover that you asked? Or? No, I mean, we, okay. I, I didn't ask a couple questions specifically, but we got to them, you know, through the other two conversations. Okay. So, no, I think we're um, working about my time limit anyway in terms of what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but um, no, I think, um, is there anything else you wanted to say? Or? No, no, I think, no, I, I really thank you for the opportunity to, to be able to express myself, which is pretty easy. But when you're passionate about something and you're knowledgeable about something, it's easier to be really passionate, you know? And, and yeah. I've made this my life work, and, and so uh, I am passionate about it. Well, your, par your passion is very apparent. <laughs> it's, you know, clear as a bell. So I, I really appreciate you, too, taking the time and oh, inviting good. me in here. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a good energy, too, kiddo. You know, you, know, maybe you look like one of my old, uh, when, when I was a young man. You know? Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah just good. <laughs> From when I went to Minneapolis College of Art and Design, you know, just... Yeah, you know, a lot of cool people there. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. So. Uh, and St. Kate's, my wife went to St. Kate's too. Oh, really? She did. Uh, she was a uh, respiratory therapist for years, and then after Kelly died, she said, I don't want to go back to, re uh, to uh, she was doing, you know, it was just uh, all this fluids and you know, respiratory and not as much money. And she said, I want to help people more. I want to be an ICU nurse. I want to go where the action is. So, okay. So she said, but I want to, because we did so much holistic stuff and so many, we went on macrobiotic diet, we did so many things um, when he was sick. So um, she said, I want to go to holistic nursing. So she went to St. Kate's program oh, for holistic okay. nursing. Okay. And then she graduated, well, any fucking jobs. There was, no, it, it was, it was, they were ahead of the curve. Absolutely. Way ahead of the curve. Yeah. There was no woodwinds in Woodbury at the time. There was nothing out there. So she got out and she goes, now what? So then she said, oh, and she went back, then she went to Denver Hills and got a, her RN um, and been working in ICU for 22 years. But she's one of the best nurses ever because she went to the holistic training. But she could kind of bring some of those skills She brought in. the holistic training with her, those tools, those skills with her, which were not even considered a skill set then. Are you kidding? Incense and the waiting room of the hospital, you know, and, yeah. and meditation and... and uh, essential oils, maybe? Essential oils? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She wears... Yeah. 
and she wears her essential oil still, and, and I know they do that there. And, and, and again, when we talk about the, the olfactory memory, is the oldest memory that we can retain things. Uh, how important um, people, people scoff at, at uh, you know, essential oils and, and aerobotherapy, and yeah. oh, yeah, it's a bunch of hippies just believing in a bunch of boo boo, woo boo. But there are, there are, there, there, there are, there are studies done. There, there, those essential oils do because they, they bring those memories, and maybe you know the, sure. the brain is there to help us. You know, it's not so much the oil. I, it, it may be you know like camphor or something makes you breathe easier, but it, I think it's really stimulating. It stimulates something or nudges something inside yeah. of you. It's not like this like really overpower. It's not like um, I don't know. It's not like taking LSD or something. No. But it's kind of having these more subtle effects that kind of nudges in certain ways. Uh, yeah, it, it, I think just a amplifies what you have in you already. I think so. You know? yeah. and I think, and that's another important in, in grief is that it, um, grief exaggerates and amplifies our personality. Oh, okay. If we were an asshole before our loss, we may become the biggest asshole ever. If we were the most loving, compassionate person before our loss, we become over the top compassionate. We really exaggerate who we are as a person. And that that's really evident. I see a lot of people that... Or, or I guess maybe another way of, um, the way I'm kind of interpreting it too, is we kind of become more authentically ourselves. Right, yeah, 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 right, right, yeah, yeah. Our, ourselves times 10, you know, and, and we've, we've, yeah, if you don't filter it, you know, I mean, some people do filter it in their eyes authentic, but I mean, they, but you, you, yeah, you, when you, in the introspection site, we discover who we are again. And, yeah. and that's why I, when I just did this workshop yesterday, and um, um, for all, all these ha all these medical people, and I talk about the, the grief in the hundred acre wood. I don't know if I told you that at all. I don't think so. No. Oh, but the grief in the hundred acre wood is, uh, I said, the, the, in communication. I, this whole thing was about communication skills and body language. But I use it in grief, so I thought I could transpose it over to the communication skills at work, and I did help, head up in the health county uh, health workers. I did too, and they loved it. Next, I said, "Who are you in the hundred acre wood?" Because I, you look at all the different um, uh, um, personality profile. You ever taken a profile, personality profile test? Like the Meyer Briggs, like Meyer Briggs, and yeah, yeah. maybe I. There's the Enneagram. There's a bunch. But the, the everybody's familiar with the Meyer Briggs, yeah. and that's the one I love to tear apart the most. <laughs> <laughs> because not tear apart, but it, compare that. You know, and I, I've taken it. I love it. I'm an ENFP, and my wife's an INFJ. And oh, oh, it, I'm, an, uh, I'm an INFP. Are you? You're INFP? Really? Yeah, so I'm an, I'm an INFP. I'm an INFP. We're the same thing. Really, huh? Yeah. It's, I've taken it twice in my life, and I'm an ENFP one time, and INFP. I really am more introverted. People think I'm really out, out introverted. That's not even a word. But, but I, I really am introverted. You know, when I get out in front of a camera, I'm great. But if I walk into a busy room, I'm in the corners. You know, I don't, you know so uh, it, it, it's funny how we, and my, so I know what my wife is, but you talk to other people, no one remembers. You got 16 personality profiles with four letters or whatever. I mean, look at all those combinations. How do you possibly retain that and understand that someone else is a whatever it is, you know, that little acronym? You don't. You walk, the same day you're thinking, this is cool, I get it, I get it, and two weeks later, you're going, I don't know what this means. And so I was talking with the, um, I read. I had to reread the book from the '70s, totally from the '70s. Uh, the the um, she of Piglet and the uh, uh, of Thou of Winnie the Pooh. Oh, sure. Okay. It's a two two out two book set, and I, and I I was laughing. I said, but it talked about um, the the five um, uh, elements of the Tao. You know, the wood, the fire, the water, the air. You know, and and I think, oh, this is really interesting. I thought, and those are five personality profiles. So I looked up that the, the five basic elements are really five basic personality profiles. And I could talk about that, but even then I talk at a workshop, I said, if you walk away, are you going to remember if you're not into Eastern philosophy, what the hell of your fire or your wood or your water? And so I said, but you will remember the Hundred Acre Wood. If you, everybody's read Hundred Acre Wood, I mean, most of the time, if you haven't read Winnie the Pooh, you can pick it up really easy. But there's five major characters in Winnie the Pooh. And each one of those represent one of the symbols of the Tao. Oh, I didn't, I wasn't even aware of that. I just, no, I just put yeah. them together. I said, oh my God, look at this and look at that, you know. And, and I said, you know, and Winnie, and people look at people, the Winnie Griever. And they said, Winnie, and he just, they said, oh, he's just done to grieving. He just seems to be okay with everything. Just goes out to breakfast every morning, goes sees his friends. Everything's okay, but I know he's grieving. He's got to go see somebody. 
If you no, he's just a poo. That's what he does. He likes structure. He likes his everyday routines, and that's how he gets through his grief because he maintains his routine. It's not that he's not grieving any more or less than anybody else. He's maintaining his routine, and so people are judging him that he's not grieving because he's maintaining his routine. And then you have rabbit, and the rabbit is just that. The people look at that, oh, they're, they're, so they're running from their grief. They're so busy at work. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're doing the, all the blah, blah, blah. They don't slow down. They're just running from their grief. They're not experiencing it. They're not processing their grief. They're running from their grief. I said, no, they're rabbits. They're running with their grief. They're not running from it. They're, running, they're drawing to their strength. Their strength of the person is the rabbit. So they're drawing on the rabbit. Rabbit, that's where I feel strong. I'll get through it by running. That's how I do it. They're not running away. They're running with because they're drawing to their strong suit. Then you have the owl. People, oh, look at the owl. He never says a word. I will just sit there in the back. Hmm. Never says a word. Never, you know, never talks to him. Ah, but still waters run deep. You ask him a question, he's researching everything. He'll tell you the answer if he knows it, but he's just not going to give it away. They're studious. They, re they research. They're quiet. The owls are. So they don't think he's not grieving because he doesn't say a word. He's an owl. That's what he's doing. He's processing it very deeply. But then you have the piglet. Oh my God, you know piglets are grieving. They're done, come up, you walk in the room, they're, ah, and they hug you and they cry and, they, and they're wearing butterflies and everything and they're talking about their loved one. Over the, they're talking about them all the time. They've got bumper stickers and, and return address labels with their loved ones on it. And, and they're just, people, oh my God, they're over the top and they're grieving. No, they're a piglet. You know, they wear their emotions on their sleeve. That's all they do. So, you know, they're a piglet. And so then you have the ER. Oh, oh ER, the hard coach metal. You know, he's the metal symbol. He's just, everything's bummer, you know? And what do you do? But no, it's ER. Everybody likes ER. We complain that he complains all the time, but God, you can't help but love ER. I know, you want to give him a hug. You want to give him a hug. Yeah. You know, and ER, he, he, he complains, but that, who's who he is? He's not complaining anymore or less in his grief. He just, that's his strong suit. So ERs are going to complain a lot more in our grief because. They kind of like complaining. It's just, it's kind of the way they operate. But they are good. They're steadfast friends. They will stick with you if thick or thin. They will give you the shirt off their back. They'll tell you it's their best shirt, <laughs> but they will give it off their back. So, and then you, so you have those characters. So which one, so I, I developed actually a, a test. It's called the, the um, Pooh Active Grieving. <laughs> Who are you in a hundred acre wood? So people take, take, I'll give you a copy if you like, but people, people look at it and, then, and decide who they are. And my, I did it at work for my wife's, all the, the doctors in the hospital at work and did the whole workshop. Mm -hmm. Now they're using it. Wow. And they're saying, oh my, they're at, at, the, at the circle, and I see you, oh, we got an ER in uh, 5B, really sad, <laughs> send a piglet in. <laughs> don't send an ER to an ER. You just don't do that. <laughs> you know? So it actually works. And then when things get really, really bad, and you need some help, and you're praying, and you talk to Chris who comes in and just gives you a little bit of help and then leaves again, just like God or Christ. Or if there, there's a really a metaphor in there that, that and he made the whole Antarctic wood out of his animals. He, he named all, each one of them. So he, it, he's the creator. And you have these five people that live in the wood. They're the tribe that take care of each other. All five personalities that all work well together. And then you have Tigger. Well, who's Tigger? He's not one of the five archetypes. He is a pathology of all the extremes. <laughs> you know, he has no boundaries. He's got attention deficit disorder. He's got everything. You know, and he pounces on people, but he only pounces on people he loves. So you forgive him. He just, he, they say stupid things. He can't help it. He's a tigger. You'll get over this. Move on. Okay, it's Tigger. Oh, that's what they say. I just know that. But Tigger only jumps on people he loves. So when they jump on you and say stupid things, realize it's just Tigger. They only jump on people they love. They wouldn't say it. They would walk. It's worse to. It's worse to walk away. But at least they jump on you. At least they're giving you some attention. You know, okay, Tigger, get away from me. You know. And then you see Kanga and Rue, and you walk and go, oh, there by the grace of God go I. I lost my child. And their woman has her baby. It was so unfair. Why? Why is Kanga so happy? You know, well, where's Mr. Rue? We don't know what Mr. Rue, do we? So you don't know Kanga's story. Don't assume that she's happy or assume they're sad. You don't know their story. You know, that maybe she's had losses too, but she's, that's the way she's dealing with it, you know? And she's got something else to, to care for. She's got something else to love. She's got something to nurture. And that's why it's so important in grief to nurture something. Why I grow my own garden? Why I make my own sauerkraut? Why that? Those are living little probiotics in that yeah. sauerkraut. In my cult, in my in my yogurt, those are living probiotics. You nurture your garden, you nurture it. You watch it grow. You're sad if it doesn't work. You know, it's all about nurturing. And so, when you put all your involvement and love into something, you lose it. It's going to hurt. 
You know, there's just no way around it. But it's all part of life, and we'll move through it and, and recover. And if, if you know who you are, you're much better suited to do it. Don't try to be an owl if you're not. <laughs> you know? Be your big lid. Yeah? I know, yeah, I would love to have.